Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today in our session on how we can better engage the private health service delivery sector in the COVID response and long-term universal health care coverage. So we'll go, we'll quickly go over some tips on using this platform. If you have any problems, uh, you can contact the support team by clicking on the live support icon on the top right corner, it's in red. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end. So please send in your questions in the live Q&A section next to the screen and make sure you, inc you include the name of the speaker you're addressing. And this session will be recorded and you can view this the next day and it will remain available for 14 days after the conference. So in order to engage and interact with all of you today, we'll be using Mentimeter. So Mentimeter is a website that allows you to provide real-time responses to questions. So on top of allowing you to respond to our questions, you will also be able to see what the other participants think about the quest question that's been posed. So if you see one of the following displays after answering a question, all you have to do is wait until we move on to the next slide and your Mentimeter will refresh. So now let's give it a try. Uh, go on your browser, on your phone or computer and visit menti.com and answer the following question. Which country do you come from? So the code for Mentimeter is 32009299. And I'll also post this in the discussion forum and I'll give you about two minutes to do this. So go to your browser to another browser on your phone or on your computer and um, answer the question, which country do you come from? You will have a code there. So I've posted the question and the code in the chat, in the discussion forum. So we have some people from Canada, Malaysia. Let's see. Else you have there? Again, the code is uh, three two zero zero nine two nine for the Mentimeter. Someone from Thailand as well. That's great. The Netherlands. We have Uganda. You have about one more minute to add in the country which you come from. We also have Zia from Pakistan on the discussion forum as well. We have Deepika from India as well, posting in the discussion forum. Okay. All righty. Great, okay, I think that's everyone about now. So now let's move on to some introductions. My name is Claire and I'm an associate at Impact for Health and Catherine, my colleague also from Impact for Health is joining us to support this session. So at Impact for Health, we have been supporting WHO's work on governance for mixed health systems over the past two years. And today this panel will be discussing the strategy that was developed for governing these mixed health systems. Our first presenter is David Clark. David Clark is the team lead for private sector engagement at WHO. David leads work on using law to achieve universal healthcare coverage, effective governance of the private sector, and he also co-leads WHO's work on anti-corruption in health. He'll be giving an overview of the strategy for private sector engagement through healthcare, through, through mixed health systems. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Claire, for the kind introduction. So I'm David Clark. Um, I lead on the institutions theme at WHO. One of the key areas that we work on in the institutions theme 
is engagement of the private sector towards universal health coverage. I think, and, and as part of that work, we work with an expert advisory group of a um, mix of academic and practitioner experts who've been advising us on how we can take a more strategic approach to working with the private sector. Over the years, WHO has done some work in relation to private sector engagement. Some of my colleagues in some of the programmatic areas, for example, TB and malaria, have done work on the private sector. But we thought at WHO it was timely to start to work on the whole topic of private sector engagement at the health system level. And that was really prompted by efforts towards universal health coverage, where we believe that these efforts really, really, really critically depend on better engagement with the private sector. Um, this comes from our program of work of 1 billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage. And this work fits within one of the key work parts of that program, which is that countries should be enabled to ensure effective health governance. And that means health governance of the whole system, not just the public, but also the private. So we, we set up this advisory group in 2019 to help us develop a draft strategy to help us to get to this goal. Today, we're going to introduce this strategy and highlight some of the successful application of the strategy with some worked country examples. My colleagues will, will speak about these during the, during the course of the session. Now, the, the session was, the, the strategy was written before the whole COVID situation started. But the, I think the vision that we had for the whole strategy of a well-governed health system in which public and private actors collectively deliver on the realization of UHC is equally as important to the COVID response. Um, the COVID response has really uh, highlighted the need for a whole of government, whole of society approach to responding to COVID. And so we think our work on the strategy, which is really about building consensus around the means, ways and means of engaging the private sector is just as relevant to COVID as it is to, 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 to long-term efforts towards UHC. Um, we, um, I just want to very briefly speak a little bit about the strategy as an overview before passing over to my colleagues who will speak about the country level application and practical application of the strategy. So the strategy is, is based around six governance behaviors. We develop these governance behaviors by looking at what countries who have successfully worked to, to engage the private sector have done. And we've distilled these key uh, behaviors that these countries have all exhibited into these six governance, governance behaviors, which we think are important for linking the work of the public and private sector. This is why we speak about um, the, the importance of managing mixed health systems. Although we speak a lot of the private sector, what we're really talking about is how we can manage the whole health system and, and align it towards the health outcomes that countries want, including UHC and including an effective COVID-19 response. And so in terms of the governance behaviors, I'm just gonna quickly outline what they are. We, we, have a, we have released a copy of the strategy and people are very much welcome to have a look at, look at it in more detail to better understand what we're talking about when we speak of these individual behaviors. The first one is, the, is building intelligence. Building intelligence involves uh, understanding and appreciating the need for health system governance and, and the role of the private sector through the use of data that allows us to understand the private sector and, and align the work of the private and public sector in relation to the COVID response and in relation to efforts towards UAC. The second governance behaviour is about fostering relations. And this is the work that needs to go on to build and sustain partnerships and coalitions. The objective in, for this governance behavior is for actors to work openly, sustainably and effectively with trust in order to achieve shared health system objectives and quite a different way of doing business in health systems. The third one is about enabling stakeholders. We've noticed from the COVID response that many private actors have wanted to get involved with the response, but in many cases have been unable to do so because of barriers in the health system. The enabling stakeholders is about ensuring that the formal tools for implementing a strategic approach to working with the private sector and other health system actors are in place. And that includes having powers, incentives and sanctions. And our objective here is to create an institutional framework that recognizes the autonomies of actors and creates decision-making space 
that provides incentives for us to all to work together to the health system objectives that countries want, such as universal health coverage and effective COVID response. The next governance behavior is about aligning structures. This is about ensuring a fit between a government's policy objectives and the different organization structures and cultures that exist in a country, public and private. The objective is for relevant stakeholders to be structured and organized in a way which is uh, actively um, contributes to and aligns with the government's health policies and priorities. The next governance behavior is a very important one, and that is the concept of nurturing trust. Trust is a very important aspect in discussions about public private engagement. Uh, and what we want, what we mean by trust is ensuring that partners are fully accountable to each other. So the public to the private and the private to the public for their actions, all aligned to the, the, the health system outcomes that we all, all want. And the last one is about delivering strategy. And this is what's important here is the importance of formulating strategic policy direction. The objective here is to make sure that everybody's on the same page with an agreed sense of direction on where that sense of direction articulates clear roles and responsibility for all health system actors, whether they be public or private. Um, now these governance behaviors can be utilized in five main traditional, what people call tools of government. Effective engagement between government and the private sector occurs in five main domains. Policy dialogue, information exchange, regulation, financing, and the provision of services. Now, we, we've all recognized that COVID-19 has strained health systems around the world, and countries have seen a variety of responses at, at different levels, global, national, state, city, and even for individual clients or patients. And we found from, from looking at what countries have done, the response has been quite mixed. Um, some countries with large private sectors have had real problem, problems, particularly where there's weak governance in the health system. In the initial stages of the pandemic, we found that private actors in many countries did go to the public sector to offer assistance. This bridged the, the um, prior lack of common interest in working together by offering a shared goal that allowed public and private actors to collaborate. And we see this as an opportunity for the introduction of, a more, of more systematic engagement mechanisms that ultimately can lead, lead to a new kind of social contract between public and private, a social contract that we need for efforts towards universal health coverage. So to mitigate the detrimental effects and promote collaboration between the actors and the sectors and to support our member states, WHO worked on this on, on, in three stages. In the first stage, we worked to identify and frame key issues the member states were facing and engaging the private sector. In the second phase, we gathered evidence, started to produce guidance and support our country offices and our member states in real time in relation to the struggles they were having with the private sector in COVID. And in phase three, which we're currently in, we've been collecting and analyzing evidence and experiences to help us inform current and future private health, future advice and, and future products to support our countries in this area. And throughout this phase, we've been engaged in dissemination communication. Now, to catalyze strategic action in this, in regard to the strategy and implement it, our advisory group has, has advised us to focus on four strategic, first four strategic priorities. The first strategic priority is to use WHO's convening power to build political will for the governance of mixed health systems. Actions in this space, and we're looking for collaboration with a range of different partners for this, is becoming a part of a network with partners with whom WHO works to build political will for the governance of the private sector in mixed health systems. The second strategic priority is about embedding these governance behaviors we've been discussing um, by defining clear roles and responsibilities to take the work forward in relation to different implementing partners. And here we are supporting the development of implementation plans and, and starting to establish indicators of good practice for governance and mixed health systems. The last strategic priority is to support learning and technical guidance, which is of course a very important aspect of the conference that we're participating in today. We are really keen to work with the research community to set the research agenda for this space and to document learnings of good practice and success stories. And this, for, for us, this is really important because we think in the past, um, this hasn't been so, so well done. 
So that's, I just wanted to give a very brief overview of the strategy and the strategic approach. So now I am going to hand back over to Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. So to just continue this conversation, would like to hear from you now. So please go to menti.com and answer the following question. What are the health governance challenges your country has faced in working with both the public and private sector in the COVID-19 response? Uh, the code again is 32009299. And I've posted this in the discussion forum and I'll give you about one and a half minutes to answer this question. Okay. Make sure you write which country you're from as well so that we know which country we're talking about. Again, the question is, what are the health governance challenges your country has faced in working with both the private and uh, public sector in the COVID-19 response? And I'll invite David to comment on the responses, please. So we're getting questions about lack of transparency um, in relation to different aspects of the response. And this is really critical uh, that, we, that we do address this issue. One of the governance behaviors that we discussed about was trust. And we can't really have trust unless there's complete transparency between public and private actors about what's going on in relation to private sector engagement. So we would definitely be promoting more transparency in relation to the, to the response and, in, and also in relation to work towards universal health coverage. And this is consistent with the um, SDG goals, which um, in, in SDG 16 talk about the importance of transparency at all levels in relation to the operation of um, the SDG goals, including health systems. I can see that there's also an issue here about uh, a lack of appreciation of the public health scientific approach and to solve problems through um, administrative directions rather than through dialogue. I mean, again, we, we are very much focusing in our governance and our work on governance of, on the importance of dialogue as part of um, working with the public and private sector. I can see a question here about the about dual practice, which is a, obviously a problem in, in many different countries, uh, and also issues around quality of care and large out-of-pocket expenditure. And these are all critical things that we're trying to address as part of the strategy and, and in relation to our work on universal health coverage. But we can't really deal with these issues unless we have a proper set of um, tools in place which engage the private sector. Um, which, uh, make sure, which, which align the work that they're doing with the, the public health goals that we all want, including reducing out-of-pocket expenditure. I can thank also you. see also- Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David, for the commentary as well. So remember, if you have any questions for the speaker, please put them in the Q&A chat on the platform and we'll address them in the Q&A session at the end. So now we'll move on to the first governance behavior, enable stakeholder, which Dr. Mark Hallowell will be presenting. Dr. Hallowell is an expert on improving public private sector engagement in health systems in both developing countries and advanced economies. He's a former special advisor to the United Kingdom Parliament's Treasury Select Committee and has worked with many organizations like the World Bank on capacity building initiatives for policymakers seeking to mobilize the private sector to accelerate and progress towards UHC. Over to you, Dr. Hallowell. Thank you, Claire, and um, good morning, everyone, from a, a cold but clear um, far north of England. Um, it's a delight to join you. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to 
focus very much on the COVID-19 situation. Um, and in particular, uh, the, uh, the collapse of the private sector in this context, particularly in the early phases of the COVID-19 outbreak, um, when uh, the, the policy response uh, was particularly severe and the, the causes, the consequences um, of, of that collapse, the nature of that collapse and some of the policy solutions that have been introduced um, and also uh, an overview of some research we intend to undertake um, to look more deeply at uh, possible solutions to this problem um, as we uh, look to tackle the future evolution of the pandemic. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the background here is one that uh, many of you will be familiar with, which is that in developing countries in particular, the private health sector is uh, responsible for a major uh, fraction of overall healthcare supply to the population. It varies a bit between different regions, um, so it's very substantial in Africa, in Latin America, in the Western Pacific. Um, it's actually a majority of total healthcare supply um, in uh, Southeast Asia and in uh, North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's a significant player in the provision of health services, essential health services to the population large parts of the population, not just the affluent, but also the general population and the poor and vulnerable in many cases. And in that context, um, our starting point, I guess, is really that you know, the activities, the capacities, uh, the operations of the private health sector are gonna play a really important role in health system responses to COVID-19 in most of the countries in these regions. Um, so, in that context, we have to recognize it, we have to focus on it as HPSR researchers, we have to take it very seriously. And I would argue that we have to uh, be concerned or at least interested when we see that the private sector is experiencing major financial and operational difficulties um, in the emergency context. In that context, we can think about the private sector in two key ways, I think. We might see it as a potential source of capacity that can be leveraged or harnessed to strengthen the response. Um, and many countries have, have approached it that way. We saw in the relatively early phases of this pandemic, uh, particularly in Europe, um, in Lombardy, for example, in Northern Italy, um, policymakers, authorities decided to leverage the private sector through contracting um, to contribute um, its capacity to the response. We also saw a similar process in England, which is still underway, um, which has increased NHS capacity to address healthcare demand attributable to COVID-19 and other essential causes. The private sector is also, of course, a potential source of challenge to the response in the sense that if needed care is costly and perhaps inaccessible to parts of the population and it's you know, performance in terms of compliance with clinical isolation and reporting standards is variable or poor, then that requires a strong regulatory response. Um, so whether we're thinking about leveraging the capacity of the healthcare sector, or we're thinking about reshaping its operations and its incentive frameworks, um, we need, as David has said, um, to have very strong uh, governance arrangements in place. And the lack of those strong governance arrangements um, in, in many countries has, in our mind, um, contributed to some of the dysfunctionality in, in this part of the response in multiple countries. So we've been doing some work on, uh, on the private sector and private sector engagement in the context of COVID-19. Um, we conducted fairly early on in the uh, pandemic, I think back in April and May, uh, we conducted some scoping interviews with national and international health system policymakers and stakeholders uh, particularly working in these regions and developing countries to gain an initial understanding of what was happening regarding private sector engagement. We found uh, some really interesting things. We found a, a range of obstacles to successful engagement. People talked about a lack of pre-existing public private sector dialogue, um, a lack of data and information and understanding of the private health sector, what it does, where it's located, what capacities it has, 
what prices it charges and so forth. Uh, and we also found a very um, uh, common finding across stakeholders and across regions and countries was that there had been a significant contraction of the private health sector's activity due to COVID-19 and related policy interventions, particularly lockdowns, but also the broader socioeconomic impact of the pandemic um, had meant that there was a lack of demand for health services. Um, there was a lack of ability to pay. Uh, insurance systems were not functioning as normal. Um, and uh, there were constraints both on the income side and the expenditure side that had led to serious dislocation of private sector service delivery. And of course, in the worst possible time, as health systems were looking to expand capacity to cope with new demand. One slide on, please. Um, so we sort of frame this as a potentially a perfect storm. Um, and um, we were interested in, in, in looking into this issue in, in much more detail and providing some guidance on how the challenge could be addressed. Um, what we saw is that in heavily affected countries in particular, COVID-19 was leading to large increases in the need for hospitalization. In less heavily affected countries, we saw that you know, by the time we moved into the early summer uh, and, and, and later summer periods, we saw an easing of lockdowns and other restrictions, which was releasing pent up demand for essential health services more generally. Um, and at this time, we were aware that um, the private sector had experienced uh, major uh, disruption uh, to its finances, to its operations, um, governments were struggling to respond to that because, as David has said, you know, the governance arrangements are often fairly weak in terms of public private sector um, engagement of all kinds. Um, and governments were very much focused on the public sector delivery system. And while being aware of the disruption to the private health sector, part of the health system were, were struggling to formulate good responses that would put that part of the health system back on its feet and get it contributing to the response. So we've been looking at two, um, two issues in particular, the mechanisms that would be most effective in sustaining the private sector's operations during COVID-19 with a view to strengthening the health system response to COVID-19. And also given that this kind of um, policy framework that we may be looking to introduce is likely to require government funding and perhaps donor financing. Uh, we're interested in exploring the, the criteria that it would be appropriate to apply to any new support arrangements to optimize the use of fiscal resources, provide transparency and protect the public interest. So what we've been doing is we've been gathering evidence on the causes and consequences of this problem and the existing policy mechanisms that are currently in use. And our next phase, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today, but the next phase of the research is to try and achieve consensus on the mechanisms to be prioritized to address this problem and the criteria that's to be applied in deploying these. Next we have slide. about two minutes, Dr. Hello. Okay, I'm going to struggle with that, so I'll do my best. Okay, so um, we initially ran a, a virtual workshop in June 2020 to elicit some initial perspectives on the nature of the problem. I see that some people who attended that are also on this meeting. Um, so um, it's uh, good that you're continuing to take an interest in this topic. Uh, we did uh, an online survey of um, individual healthcare businesses in nine African countries. We had about 110 responses. Uh, and we were looking at, um, if you like, the symptoms of the problem in terms of the impact on service, avail service availability, finances, and staffing. Um, and, uh, and also the policy solutions that are currently in place. And we undertook a, a document analysis of all the information we could find on this topic in the media and elsewhere uh, and triangulated across these sources. Um, and what we found was, I better move on to the next slide now since we're running a bit late. What we found was that um, there had indeed been, uh, according to our survey respondents in the private healthcare sector and their representative bodies in, in, in these nine African countries, uh, alongside the document analysis we conducted, we found that there had indeed been a serious 
disruption to private sector operations, significant reductions in service availability, so many facility closures. Uh, we saw um, a, a routine and consistent pattern of staff layoffs and furloughing, uh, such that the overall capacity, service delivery capacity of these organizations had been significantly compromised by the pandemic and the responses to it. Um, we uh, asked for data on the causes and as expected, we found government restrictions on, on healthcare delivery were one, reduced demand from the population due to a lack of social mobility and a lack of ability to pay. Um, Government responses at the moment relatively limited and focused very much on short term support, so tax deferrals, um, uh, uh, low cost loans, these sorts of things, but not really policy solutions that are getting to the root causes of the problems. And, and the consequence of that has been obviously very significant from the point of view of the population's overall access to and utilization of both COVID-19 related services and other essential services during the pandemic. So precisely at the time that we want the entire health system to be on its feet and, and able to act in an optimum way to address the need for healthcare, this significant portion of the health system has been significantly disrupted. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's apparent to us at this point that where it accounts for a significant fraction of healthcare supply, the private sector uh, is a major health systems issue. It's a major topic that as HPSR researchers, I think we should be taking an interest in. It's a very contentious area, um, but it is a large part of the health system and we need to think about it very carefully and, and ensure that governance arrangements and policy frameworks are properly configured to take into account its important role in the health system. Um, <clears throat> our data indicate that how whole health systems, public and private, are enabled makes a, di a big difference to how problems are manifest and their severity, and the toolkit, if you like, that is available to try and respond to them. So you could see the current problems in the private health sector as indicative of a lack of strong governance, and also the limited toolkit that exists at the moment to respond to those is also indicative of a lack of the sorts of strong governance arrangements that David and his team are calling for in the strategy. So just very briefly, our next step is to convene a Delphi process or reconvene a Delphi process because we initiated this some months ago. Uh, and we're looking to try and define the most promising pathways forward to get the private health sector back on its feet through policy mechanisms that protect the public interest, but sustain the operations of the private sector specifically during the COVID-19 outbreak and also beyond. And enable support to focus on those providers whose role in the health system is most mission critical at this point, but also in terms of the, the longer term health system goals that policymakers have, um, and, uh, and to try and ensure that there is transparency around that and that the resources really flow to the parts of the health system that make the most material and important difference to population health. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hallowell, for articulating that very well. Next, we'll have Ms. Maraki Fikre presenting on the governance behavior, building understanding and foster relations. Uh, Ms. Fikre is a private sector specialist who has over 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry across North America, the Middle East and Africa. Ms. Fikre currently consults for institutions like the Global Financing Facility, the World Bank, WHO on private sector in health engagement activities across the world. Over to you, Ms. Fikre. Thank you so much, Claire. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, We're different time zones. So it's a pleasure to, to be attending this session. I'll, uh, so I'm taking the framework that's been presented by David and, and Mark and sort of using a case study uh, where we've been engaged, which is the case study of Myanmar uh, and an interesting uh, sort of uh, acceleration of private sector engagement uh, pre and post uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So just to give you a quick context about Myanmar, uh, ex-Burma, uh, you can see it on the map there, new government regime that started up in 2011 and really the country started opening up there. 
and of course, uh, based on learnings regionally, be it Thailand and other in terms of private sector activity, there was a lot of interest from government to sort of start learning and understanding and they knew the need to increase private sector engagement immediately to, to sort of find impact. So it was in uh, September 2019 when we were part of the World Bank Group and the GFF Group that sort of started uh, engaging, organizing and uh, working both with the Ministry of Health there as, as well as the private sector actors engaged there. So interestingly in Myanmar, one of the things that made it a little bit different in terms of its successes um, and their worst ch challenges is that the government has signed a group which is called the Myanmar Academy of Medical Science, MAMS we'll call them, which is basically a group of maybe five uh, very senior leaders that have worked in government, military hospitals and other, so very well respected on the government side but also re, uh, then retired and started working in the private sector side. So being able to be the sort of a task force mediator and they have a buy-in from both sides, which is an interesting uh, uh, model uh, to, to, to look at in terms of uh, the country. And then eventually the Ministry of Health and Sports supported the establishment of, of the private sector uh, department within the, the government, quite active and they've been working very closely with the moms group to start. So when we started getting engaged there, we, we started through the moms group supporting the Ministry of Health. And the first thing was, of course, to start understanding the landscape of private sector actors. As you can understand, the challenges with private sector engagement in health is really trying to organize the private sector, understand what the size of them, where are they most active, what are the challenges, the barriers. So a private sector health assessment is the first tool. Then post-COVID, uh, this whole thing accelerated and uh, post-COVID starts March uh, with the WHO and approach JFF. Both of them actually decided to support a five-week sprint for COVID-19. And at that point, ministry government was extremely interested to see how to accelerate, understand how to engage and which sector of the private sector stakeholders they could engage in an action plan. So we started developing a five-week sprint action plan, uh, really looking to develop a public-private engagement plan uh, that will be implemented immediately. So next slide. So it, how does that support some of the governance behaviors David has been talking to about? So the first one, building understanding. The first thing is, and we believe in that, is that data plays a significant role. So both on public sector and private sector, who are they? Who's uh, most active? What, what capacity does the private sector have? And I'd like to sort of ac uh, stress around this post-COVID five-week sprint. And it accelerated that type. So rather than the lengthy private uh, health sector landscape assessment that we had started previously, within five weeks, every day, some of the mom's, uh, mom's uh, stakeholder group actually identified key other private sector actors, both in testing, uh, potential hospital owners, but also uh, supply chain, which I, I think you find it in many countries, supply chain management in terms of PPE procurement distribution has been a significant challenge for COVID, but obviously uh, further on for sustainability. So there were three technical working groups that were meeting on a daily basis. They met uh, online and started, and we so, sort of helped them gather data. What do they have? What types of machines? What types of PCR machines do they have? Can they complement? What is the quality that they provide? And the Ministry of Health was then very much engaged. Literally every week there was a report back to Ministry of Health in terms of making, giving them insight as to what's the capacity of the private sector and if there's any challenges in quality, policy level, what the, can they do to, to, to impact. Actually just uh, after I've organized this slide two days ago, the Ministry of Health announced because they knew that one of the barriers for engaging private sector in testing was the policy. They didn't have a policy framework to enable uh, private sector to complement testing. And they allowed now, and they're doing certification uh, on some of the private sector uh, labs as well as hospitals to actually uh, engage in COVID-19. So that was uh, really exciting news. Simply post this action plan, 
and uh, really acting on some policy aspects. So this is data is important for building uh, understanding. The next um, governance behavior. Three minutes left. Ms. Sure. Fostering relations, and I think uh, David has spoken ab about this quite a bit. Uh, so the tool of having a very strong public-private dialogue. And we work with this tool quite a bit across many countries. And it's, we've seen it to be uh, quite successful in building trust, understanding, basing it on the data that we have. So you can see the typical phases of building a public-private dialogue may take sometimes about a year. But in the, in the case of Myanmar, it was uh, accelerated uh, due to COVID. And I can, uh, it's quite interesting to see that the moms group as well as a wider private sector stakeholders actually meet on a weekly basis now, uh, even uh, going beyond the topic of COVID-19. So ne next slide. So what, of course there were challenges, but the, the most interesting part is aligning vision, agreeing on measures of success. How do we uh, make it more sustainable? There were of course some uh, partners that were representing individual interests and how to, to address that. But the key successes of Myanmar is really having achieved a core group of leadership group, honest broker to, to drive the PPD. And this is now being sustained even post COVID and we're leveraging and increasing representations from different uh, private sector members. So uh, quite an interesting uh, case study in, in terms of uh, those two governance behaviors. Final slide. So quick summary, case study Myanmar really uh, very well illustrates how you can build a significant understanding, which is mainly based on data, making sure the data for both public and private, uh, you know, paints an objective uh, landscape uh, of what can be done and where are the priorities to engage private sector and fostering relationships, the use and catalyst of a PPD dialogue, public-private dialogue. And also I go back to the moms group, which is a leadership group that had buy-in from both, both, uh, both uh, public and private in order to drive this. So thank you very much. I, uh, you know, Claire, if you can take this back. Thank you, Ms. Fikre. And uh, again, we want to hear from everyone on the platform. So please go to menti.com and answer the following question. How has the private and public sector uh, in your country managed to build understanding and foster relations during the COVID-19 response? And the code is the same and it has been posted in the discussion forum as well. And it's on top of the slide as well. So you have about two minutes to answer this question and I'll invite Ms. Fikre to give some comments on the responses as well. So the code is 320929. And also remember to include the name of your country in your response as well, so that we know what the context is. Claire, can I answer the questions on the chat? Ah, yes, I guess you can answer as we sure. wait for some sure. feedback, yeah. So there's a question about what's the nature of private sector in Myanmar. Uh, yes, so big corporate hospitals uh, that are tertiary level, mainly uh, around the city, uh, Yangon, uh, but also very few single doctor clinics all around the country. So beyond the, the big urban ones, yes, medium to small clinics, a significant number of uh, pharmacies and so forth from the pharma sector. Um, uh, and then still a lot of military hospitals, much more than the missionary charitable, uh, still significant uh, dominance of uh, military hospitals. Okay, thank you, Ms. Vikri. So I think we'll move on to our next presenter now. So uh, our next presenter is uh, Professor Rahman. And Professor Rahman, he teaches at the University of, University of Delhi and his research focuses on leveraging public-private partnership to improve equitable access to healthcare services for the poor. So he's actively engaged in advisory work with bilateral and multilateral development partners in Asia, Africa, 
and the East Mediterranean region. And he has several research publications, including a book called Public-Private Partnership in Healthcare in India, Lessons for Developing Countries. So over to you, Professor Raman. Thank you, Claire. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to a lot of you uh, who uh, come from different parts of the world. Uh, uh, as, uh, as, as laid out by both Mark and David, uh, I am just building upon uh, what some of the points that they have mentioned. Uh, very often when we discuss about aligning structures, uh, we tend to focus on uh, an ecosystem wherein policy, legal and institutional framework is in place for private sector engagement within COVID framework or within COVID context or outside the COVID context beyond uh, uh, COVID times. Uh, but besides the you know, ecosystem, we are also talking about uh, partnership structures, organizational unit, financing mechanisms, regulatory and governance arrangements. This uh, is in a large context, is the structures that we are talking about when we discuss about private sector engagement. I would be contextualizing this in uh, Indian uh, scenario. And in the month of June, uh, one of me and one of my colleague from the advisory group had uh, come out with the seven uh, areas of uh, strategies for collaboration with the private sector in the pandemic situation. So I will be using those seven plus one more I have added here, eighth dimension. And that's more or less what will be my focus on uh, the strategy and how the structures uh, gets, gets aligned to these eight strategies. Uh, within the Indian context, uh, almost all provinces in India, uh, they, they were not prepared within the, with, the, with the necessary structures and the systems uh, for engaging the private sector. They still do not have one, uh, but neither did they have any kind of expertise or strategies to influence and to collaborate with the private sector. This is clearly visible uh, even today uh, in terms of the manner in which and the consequent uh, challenges that we face in India in terms of engaging the private sector in the fight against COVID. Uh, in the broad, in the eight broad interrelated strategies that we have, uh, which is visible here, we are looking at it in the, from the point of view of uh, resources, staff, uh, the word is sub, stuff is given slangishly, which is supplies and uh, deployment of systems. Let's look at the strategy number one in terms of planning and coordination. Uh, in Indian context, the, a task force was created in the month of March and the 12 empowered groups were set up uh, with, under the direct control of the prime minister's office. There are many central and federal uh, level and as well as provincial level bodies which uh, represented in this particular empowered group. And this empowered, one of the empowered group was primarily focused on private sector engagement. And they did have a great deal of dialogue and uh, discussion about a certain, um, you know, uh, uh, deployment of resources, the capacities, uh, the mutual exchange of resources, etc. But uh, still, uh, 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 th these, these matters are a matter with the provincial governments and therefore different provincial governments have used a different kind of strategies in order to uh, dialogue with the private sector in order to uh, you know, deploy the resources from the private sector. One of the uh, planning stage happened to be in the month of uh, March or April, um, there was a quick uh, mapping of uh, public and private sector resources, such as ICU beds, number of ventilators, doctors, all that kind of resource mapping was done. And wherever the resource mapping suggested a greater uh, you know, uh, role for the private sector, uh, there was a greater effort or uh, you know, a, a, a push for private sector collaboration. So in a way, that particular kind of a strategy did initially start off well. Let's look at the second strategy in terms of screening yes, or diagnosis and the referring. Uh, I'm sorry, Claire? Two minutes left. Sometime. Okay. Uh, as of today or yesterday, 121 million tests have been carried out in India. Out of about 2,085 laboratories across the country, about 950 of them are from the private sector. For example, states like Andhra Pradesh and Bihar used telehealth centers to screen the potential COVID cases and refer them to their respective places. Uh, most states have included tests in the private labs under health insurance reimbursement option. In uh, strategy number three, in terms of hospital treatment, 
uh, based on the severity of cases in terms of uh, whether they would be requiring isolation or they require supervision or they require uh, you know, admission in ICU, uh, three, degree, uh, three levels of health facilities were uh, categorized and the protocols for referral of patients to, from isolation center to ICU was put in place. Many states developed large and small COVID care facilities. For example, uh, railways had converted many of its coaches to become uh, you know, isolation wards and centers. Uh, Prime ministers, uh, you know, there is a insurance scheme, national insurance scheme, temporarily accredited a large number of private hospitals to provide emergency care and treatment for non-COVID cases. Mark had already indicated about private sector hospital facing their revenue losses. That's a different matter altogether. I will not touch upon that. In terms of fourth strategy, supplies and procurement, uh, repurposing of uh, private manufacturing capacity in terms of uh, you know, ventilators and test kits and biomedical equipment, PPP, uh, sorry, uh, 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 the PPEs, has been a great deal of uh, eye-opener in Indian context. Uh, PPE kits, for example, from bulk importer to a net, net ex exporter within three months was possible in Indian context, that was because of the collaboration between Ministry of Textiles and uh, you know, Defense Research and Development Organization as well as Ministry of Health. In terms of human resources, a great deal of uh, uh, effort was put in in terms of contracting doctors who retired as well as from the private sector, people who were deployed for TB and HIV and malaria, they were also redeployed into this. This is all temporary arrangement. There wasn't anything like a permanent structures to really uh, manage this. So they were all under the same umbrella of uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, group, which is, which is working in the Ministry of Health. In terms of strategy six, uh, information and communication technology, uh, besides the telemedicine and telehealth consultation, we also, I think the government of India developed the uh, Ministry of Information Technology as an app called Arogya Setu. And this is for monitoring, both self-monitoring as well as monitoring the status of the uh, COVID uh, cases within the community. A centralized data center was also established. Uh, in terms of social safety net, uh, you would have seen from television channels, uh, a large proportion of migrant labor were moving from their cities to their uh, respective hometowns. So government had invited uh, more than 90,000 civil society organizations to apply for a grant in aid to them to provide relief and uh, in terms of shelters and food, uh, you know, isolation facilities and food grains to be supplied to their, uh, you know, red spots centers, etc. Hotspots, sorry, hotspot centers, etc. The last of the strategy is in terms of mobilizing private sector resources and the donor resources. There is an exclusive COVID fund directly under the control of the Prime Minister was, has been created. Both the public and the CSR funds are mobilized. Development partners, particularly uh, BMGF and the Rockefeller Foundations have offered to support vaccine development and the biomedical technology equipment, et cetera. So today we have almost three candidates for vaccine in India. In conclusion, uh, based on the reading that I, one, uh, one goes through, uh, and also the kind of a consensus that we have in within our advisory group. Uh, countries that show that have a, a, a structure in place for public private sector dialogue and a public private sector interface seem to be uh, responding more robustly to the pandemic compared to those countries which is still discovering a platform for public private sector dialogue. So it's important for all of us, even post pandemic, to consider this a serious issue in terms of how do we align the structures uh, in order to create this uh, policy, legal and institutional framework for public and the private sector resources to be pulled together. And that's more or less what I wish to say. Uh, back to you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman. It's very interesting to see how India has come together to respond to the pandemic. So next uh, we have uh, Ms. Robina Kitingu. Ms. Robina is the Executive Director at Ugandan National Health Consumers Organization and she'll be speaking on the Governance Behavior and Nature Trust. Ms. Robina spearheaded the adoption for Uganda's Patients Charter and led advocacy for enactment of the Uganda Tobacco Control Act for which she received the Global Empower Award. So over to you, Ms. Robina. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to be in this meeting.
I'm going to talk about the nurture trust, one of the behaviors for the strategy. In Uganda, we have a public-private partnership in health policy, which is the forum and the government indication of trust and the need to build a relationship with the private sector. We also have a public-private in health working group, which for good faith is chaired by the private sector, which has an umbrella, Uganda Healthcare Federation. So, there is a framework that has instilled a level of trust and confidence and provided a platform for a voice for the private sector, an effort to show transparency and accountability. So the private sector has worked in the COVID response. The private sector has been given the responsibility to lead the training component. And this is a, supposed to bring on board the private sector, which is gives the majority of services, especially in Kampala. And one of the areas of mistrust has been data, data use, data capture. So what has happened in Uganda, where in Kampala, for instance, in the city where you have over 80% of services provided by the private sector, the mistrust has been on the way government captures data and does not embrace the data from the private sector. So there's an effort that is led by this partnership under the policy to capture private sector data in Kampala, the restraining of public providers and mentoring for them to adopt the government tools and be able to supply data that government can work with to improve progress. And more, the large majority of COVID cases have been in Kampala, so this is a very welcome development. There is also the, 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 the other areas of training are the lower level private sector uh, facilities, for instance, drug shops, maternity homes, and there is an effort by the partnership to get these to understand how to respond to the COVID response, to the COVID cases. But of course, there are challenges. There are big challenges, even with that policy. You will see that the we need to build on, continue to build on trust that has been established. And in the COVID response, for instance, the challenges in the, in the private sector have been a level of lack of transparency and sharing of resources, including, for instance, supplies, PPEs, reagents, IEC materials, contact tracing, but also, of course, the private sector needs space for isolation. When patients come and they have or suspected to have COVID-19, there's need for the private sector to be supported to be able to address isolation and contact tracing. So those are some of the areas that the Uganda government needs to address and that remain to be able to integrate it within the public-private partnership working policy and, be, and, and build more confidence and be on the stage to move to the next, especially sharing resources. But we believe that this is going to be addressed. And uh, I think the policy, what the policy, the, the strategy can do is to be able to give out more information on what the strategy can do, but also what WHO can do to support countries which have already embarked on building trust to be able to support them to increase the trust that is out there. Uh, of course, the other challenges are quality in the public and private sector together that we need to be able to address policy uh, quality. And this is an area for transparency and accountability that the private sector and the public can work on to open more information, to agree on the areas that are hindering quality and how to address them together. But we think there is a, a future for Uganda in terms of building public-private partnership trust. Thank you, over to you.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Kitungi. And now we'll move on to our final presenter, Dr. Trifin Zulu. So Dr. Zulu is a senior manager at the Government Employees Medical Scheme in South Africa. She has extensive experience in pharmacy practice, health policy, and health economics. She's currently working in the private health insurance sector, which is involved in clinical risk management. She also serve, or serves on the WHO's advisory group focusing on governance of the private sector for uni universal healthcare coverage. Over to you, Dr. Zulu. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for the opportunity to present in this uh, conference. Um, greetings from South Africa, and good morning to everybody. Um, I will just share the case study of South Africa and how uh, the COVID response was driven by both the private sector and the public sector, and uh, primarily just starting with the formal structures that we have in place. So before COVID hit, there was already a platform uh, between the government and its social partners that includes uh, organized labor, that includes big business and other smaller businesses that are represented in this forum, and also civic society. And beyond that uh, platform, there's also a, a health specific platform that's coordinated by the presidency. And in this platform, uh, the goal is to strengthen the health system towards an integrated and unified health system. So there in the, in, in the objective of this presidential compact already there is that recognition and acknowledgement of the role of the private sector in shaping or in, in provision of healthcare services. And it aims to bring together all healthcare stakeholders. So there is private sector, there's academia, there's civic society, all represented there and also patient groups uh, that meet on a re regular basis to discuss issues pertaining to healthcare. And then moving on to the COVID specific work group. So COVID happened at a time when already there were all these forums, there already, was already a system in place for, um, for convening uh, the private sector and the public sector around issues of healthcare. And the private sector was uh, played a very big part. And this, uh, this specific work group, the COVID work group, was coordinated by the Minister of Health and the hospital groups involved, there was pathology groups, there was uh, academia, there was big business that also played a very big part in terms of sourcing uh, uh, PPEs, in terms of sourcing testing reagents and all the related stuff for, for COVID-19. On the next slide, um, the one other factor that has led to a, a, a more coordinated response in South Africa, you'll see in terms of the COVID numbers, we seem to have managed to bring down the pandemic and the response was very comprehensive to COVID because uh, well, there wasn't all, not only, it wasn't all, only the, the the, the government and the private sector coming together, but also there was enabling legislation and clear policies for effective oversight. For, for example, if we look at um, access to care, there was promulgation of regulations that uh, for the private sector or for the private insured uh, 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 population to cover them and to ensure that they have basic access to their services for COVID-19 without having to pay out of pocket. So from that point of view, for members that are privately insured accessing care in the private sector, there was legislation to enable access to, access to care and also to protect uh, uh, for financial security as well. And then there was also a, to enable um, provision of services was lifting of annual registration fees for nurses and also uh, in terms of prescriptions in the private sector um, we have regulations that govern how for how long a prescription is valid for so it was moved from six it was reviewed um, from six months to 12 months to allow uh, people during the lockdown who couldn't go and see their doctors in their stable chronic patients to access their, their medicines or their prescriptions from the pharmacies and um, in terms of the regulations as well, we've got very strong uh, competition regulations. So for the purposes of COVID during this time, there was a relaxation, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. There was a relaxation of the regulations to allow the private funders to engage with pathology labs and also across the entire health sector to allow that engagement without violating the competition rules around pricing, around pricing regulations. And you'll see on the, on, in the middle part of the slide that because of that engagement, there was a move in the pricing of, of uh, pathology testing for, for, or the PCR test for COVID. It moved from around, uh, around 89 US dollars to around 35. So that was because the regulations were enabling uh, the engagement between the private sector uh, providers, uh, funders, and, and the pathology labs. But also, the, in, in terms of the pathology labs, there was that engagement between the government, 
the private sector, uh, the, the public sector labs and, and the private sector labs, make sure that the testing could be done both in the private sector and the public sector. And to that point, on a daily basis, uh, the Minister of Health will announce to the, to the public how many tests have been done in the public sector, how many have been done in the private sector. So it's all reported by one entity. And as we speak right now, I think about 58% cumulatively being done in the private sector and 42% being done in the, in the public sector. And all of that is coordinated and reported centrally by the Minister of Health. And on the last uh, part of the slide, um, uh, sorry, Claire, just this one slide, uh, there was also regulations to protect citizens from price gouging um, to, the, to the point that even the regulations is, is on paper, they found expression in practice uh, such that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies was fined um, uh, for price gouging for surgical masks. And it was in an effort to protect citizens from private sector um, uh, pricing that might be uh, increased just because there is a pandemic. So if you look at the South African healthcare sector, there's regulation of pricing of medicines, but we don't have a pricing uh, regulations for, for, for surgical masks, for devices and, 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 and other, and other um, equipment. So because of that realization, the government saw it fit that we should, they should come up with regulations to protect citizens because that was always going to be a, 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 a challenge if the pricing was not regulated during that time. And also the uniform protocols in, in both the public and private sector in terms of who gets tested, how are reports, um, how do you report the, the testing? And also in terms of management of, of COVID-19, there's also a very clear way of how patients are managed both in the public sector and the private sector. And the other additional thing, uh, there was data sharing between the public and private sector to drive decision making. So at any given point, we knew the, the capacity of hospitals to accommodate uh, um, uh, patients with COVID-19. We knew the capacity of the private sector labs and the public sector labs to, uh, to do the testing for COVID-19. And they developed a common database, which provided visibility of resources between uh, across the public and private sectors. And uh, there was also a ramp up of the diagnostic testing capacity uh, between the private sector and the public sector and uh, the COVID modeling and analytics. So the government didn't have this, this sort of expertise, but the private sector came forward and, uh, and, and, and volunteered their services, uh, expertise to come up with COVID modeling uh, tools and analytics to inform the government in terms of how do you move from level five lockdown to level four to level one? So all of that was, was driven mostly by the private sector, but coordinated by the public sector. And then in terms of the tariffs, because the government had been uh, buying services from the private sector, the government employees medical scheme came forward to assist the government with uh, the sort of the tariff schedule that they use to, uh, to negotiate with the private sector. And that formed the basis of engagement between the state and the private hospitals. Uh, moving forward to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to highlight specifically this, the role of the private sector as um, uh, particularly the business for South Africa, which was um, the main coordinator of, of, the, um, of the services or the coordinator of the effort from the private sector. So they were responsible for uh, assisting in scaling up of testing, in securing medical equipment, including uh, PPE, including oxygen concentrators. What they did here, they provided the expertise to government. They provided the funding as well to secure all of these uh, resources to ensure that the, the COVID response was adequate. And as you can, as you can see from the data um, from South Africa, you will see that we're, we're, we're able to bring it down or to control and contain the, the pandemic because of this um, uh, work between the private sector and the public sector. And the private sector is also responsible for coordination of funding instruments for the COVID-19 response, and also for providing the tariff information as I've mentioned in the previous slide. And moving on to the next slide, I just had a talk with one of the uh, technical um, um, resources that was responsible on the government side in negotiating with the private sector. And his, his, and his thoughts around the lessons learned during this period was that it was very important that there was data sharing between uh, the public sector and the private sector, particularly as we move towards the national health insurance, which is our version of UHC. And it was important that um, Everybody is aware that without data sharing, there is no way that we can move uh, towards the UHC, uh, towards a comprehensive detailed uh, uh, response uh, in the universal health care coverage sphere. And a lot of progress was made during the height of the COVID pandemic, but then his feelings that it now needs to be entrenched and properly regulated as provided for in the regulations. And his other sentiments that if we're to move away from these two parallel universes between 
uh, private sector and the public sector, there was a need for uh, longer term ministerial advisory committees because right now we've got the private sector being part of these advisory committees, but it's short term. So the, the for so going forward to make sure that there is that entrenched um, a response, um, we need to have longer term advisory committees between the private sector and the and the public sector, and. Um, one very big learning in terms of private sector engagement is that the formalized structures representing the private sector are key to efficient engagement with government. So it's very difficult to engage with 50, 60 different stakeholders, but if these are represented by one body, it makes it more efficient. And this was um, very uh, prominent in the pathology space, but also because the business for South Africa, which is the private sector arm, of, 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 this, uh, of this platform it was very involved in coordinating the private sector response. And through them, the Solidarity Fund, which was um, um, coming together, private sector businesses, they put money together to fund or to support the COVID-19 response. So the initiatives of the Business for South Africa um, were very important in, uh, for instance, bring uh, the PPE to South Africa, importing from different countries, and also in lending support to the state for ventilator capacity. And the one thing that came out of this was that um, the business for South Africa during that period, they came up with different uh, mechanisms, particularly for the for quality uh, control. We didn't have a quality control mechanisms for anything else other than medicines. And during this time, they, they built this quality control system, which they've now- Can you wrap up, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, so they've, they've, the one thing is that they've built to, uh, a quality control system which they've handed over to the state to take over, to implement in terms of all PPE that comes into the country and devices, they will now go through this quality control. Um, so that's all I had, Claire, I think I'll stop here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Zulu. So throughout the presentation, you've been sending questions on the platform. So the first question uh, is posed to David and I'll give you about uh, 45 seconds to answer this. So the question is, this is from Catherine and I'll join it with, with uh, another question from Taufiki. The question is the governance elements of the strategy are very, very positively framed. I wonder if accountability and transparency need to be more strongly emphasized in these to give a balanced approach. And that goes along with, uh, is there any framework to assess the governance behaviors for the COVID-19 response? David? Um, thanks. So we only had a very short time to present the, the governance the strategy today and definitely accountability and transparency is a very key part of our work. Um, we see it as a critical aspect of private sector engagement, and that's why we emphasize things like trust and the importance of data sharing and, and, and information sharing between the public and the private system. So yeah, we agree that we agree wholeheartedly that this is a very important aspect of this work. Um, sorry, Claire, could you remind me what the second part of the question was? Uh, the second part is if the governance behaviors have been assessed, if there's any framework to assess the governance COVID-19 response. We're in, we're in the middle of doing that right now. And, and now we have the, the, the whole idea of, uh, just, just, to, just to explain the, the, the direction of travel for all this work. We started working on the governance framework before COVID. And then we stopped because of the COVID response. We thought it was more important to pivot and to work specifically to support member states in the emergency. But the more we got into the, 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 um, into the response efforts, we discovered that the issues that we were finding and the struggles that countries were having really need, we really emphasized the need for us to finish off the governance strategy. And that's what we've done. And as part of our next phase of work, we are going to be writing up the lessons that we've learned from applying the governance strategy in our, in our specific COVID response. Uh, we haven't got a formal framework yet for doing that because we just haven't had time because we've, we've really focused on, on um, responding to the urgent situation that countries have found themselves in. But that is definitely something that we're going to do. And in fact, the next stage with the evolution of the strategy is to produce uh, a, a very, clear operational plan, which will explain, based on the lessons that we've learned from the COVID response, how we operationalize the strategy at country level. Because we're very conscious at the moment, it's very conceptual, but we hope that the presentations from our various colleagues today have shown you 
uh, how the strategy can actually work in practice at the country level. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. So we don't have much time left now, but if you have in your country or your context a way that we could pilot this governance behaviors, please feel free to send your contact details in the chat and we can follow up with you on implementation of this governance behaviors. So thank you everyone. And it's been a pleasure. And thank you so much to our speakers as well. Have a good day.